Hello, good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, special class dedicated to William Shakespeare in uh, British television. Um, uh, my name is Victor Huertas Martin and uh, there you are my email in case you want to talk to me or ask me a couple of questions in case uh, there is anything of interest to you here in this presentation and uh, uh, normally what I do is I work as a part-time instructor at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and also I am a, a collaborating teacher at the uh, Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia and I've been lucky uh, to have the chance to, uh, to, uh, to do this class uh, for you today. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be dealing with the figure of William Shakespeare um, through the 20th century and through the to the early 21st century in the map of British television. Um, so I'm going to be paying attention to several um, important um, points over this period, including, of course, the early development of television drama between the 1930s and the 1950s. Uh, I will explain what are the most important features concerning Shakespeare uh, in the post-war period and the Golden Age, and I will comment on the lights and the shadows of the famous BBC Shakespeare series, which some of you may be familiar with because it has been a very uh, frequently used educational tool for students in English studies in Spain and elsewhere. And also I'm going to comment on the peculiar features of um, the recordings carried out by the Royal Shakespeare Company, which as you know is today perhaps the most renowned um, theatre company dedicated to Shakespeare and the classics in the English-speaking language, of course. And um, apart from this, I want to uh, briefly comment on some, some other achievements, including the inclusion of Shakespeare in the serial format, which is a very contemporary phenomenon, although, of course, it has been going on for, uh, for a few decades already, as we will see in a few moments. So, uh, so I hope you enjoy the, the, the lecture and I hope you, you have some, some questions uh, for me or for, for yourselves. And, uh, and of course, there is an abandoned corpus of bibliography which will help you in this regard. And there is a lot to do in this, in the, in this regard, in Shakespeare on television. Um, let me briefly clarify that... Um, uh, I need to, um, to apologize because this is going to be a very, very rough and very general overview of Shakespeare on television. It is impossible to um, <clears throat> define Shakespeare on television in 50 minutes or, or 45, 50 minutes. Um, so I'm going to provide a map, uh, an overview of what I have seen that Shakespeare on television has been only in Great Britain or more specifically speaking in, in England and um, perhaps more, more particularly in, in BBC and also other TV channels, but mostly everything gravitates around public television or television as a source of public education and public service. So, of course, uh, this vision is not complete. Uh, we are not dealing with uh, Shakespeare on film, which provides also an abandoned corpus, uh, and I'm not tackling the recent phenomenon of uh, Shakespeare in life live performance or live cinema performance, which, as you know, is becoming one of the most um, intense and undemocratic ways of spreading Shakespeare plays across the world. Um, but, of course, it is a very important phenomenon which deserves attention, together with cinema. And, of course, these phenomena, these phenomena dialogue with each other uh, intensely. So... Um, the first concept we should clarify here is the, the, the problem of television and film, uh, because uh, there seems to be some doubt today, thinking about the 21st century and about what television is. Uh, thinking of um, HBO, Netflix, and uh, the big series, which are, as many people say, the, 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 the eighth art um, uh, of, of the 21st century. There is this legend, this myth, that, um, that um, cinema was the... The, 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 the biggest art in the 20th century, and that the series is going to be the, to the, the art of the 21st century. Uh, together with all these assumptions, there is the, 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 the assumption that, um, that the series is becoming more cinematic, um, implying, of course, that the series are gaining quality, or that television is gaining quality. And here we can find a point of controversy for many scholars. Of course, <coughs> many scholars would agree, yes, of course, uh, f series are becoming much more cinematic because they include 
uh, film actors and there is a higher budget and much higher quality in the presentation, the color, the texture and the detail. Of course, yes, that's true. But, uh, but of course, some, some scholars like Deborah Jaramillo, who is one of the most important and renowned scholars on television today, would say that there is no reason why we should consider series as cinematic, meaning better or meaning more qualified. Um, if we are referring to technology or to technological development and, adv and advancement, television is by definition a technological medium which has always relied upon technological innovation. Uh, and of course, um, it has borrowed from different genres like, like film, like literature, of course, and, and definitely video art and, uh, and many other art forms. So uh, we should clarify that, of course, although there are thresholds, although there are points of connection between film and television, they are not equivalent and they are definitely not synonyms in this respect. Um, when I did my PhD dissertation, uh, the topic, uh, the, the argument was precisely this. Uh, I was focusing on a few productions on Shakespeare on television and uh, my point was that the languages of film, television and theatre would emerge in, in a series of productions. Um, one of the criticisms I got, uh, which in my opinion I think was pretty valid, um, was that um, it is difficult to know what are the features of television and film and theater because these features are contingent. They change across the time or they change through time. And, and this is true, it's true. Uh, in this respect, my, 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 uh, my definition, my organization of features was, um, I would say, defective. Um, if we consider contingency, and, and, and yes, it's true. However, um, it is true that television has certain codes and certain ways of working which uh, um, still make it quite an, 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 a, a personal or personal or um, genuine um, mode of presentation of contents. Um, I'm speaking about fiction in television. And, and of course, um, there are many things we should discuss in this respect, but, uh, but uh, there were a few criteria which I presented in relation to television in Great Britain, and more specifically, um, British television drama, meaning television drama and theatre, including, of course, um, the concept of theatre in this rather broad category of drama, which, of course, is problematic. But let's, uh, let's imagine provisionally that it works and that uh, there is a point to be made here. And perhaps we could use this criteria, or my proposal is that we use these criteria to contrast them with uh, the different manifestations of uh, Shakespeare in, uh, in British television. And of course, um, I'm happy with uh, any, any suggestions or with any criticism to, to this. But, but of course, um, uh, it's not just me who thinks that. Many other authors have defined British television or British television drama in, in this way. So um, some of the features uh, which we are going to comment upon uh, on British television drama would be this. First of all, uh, as opposed to the theatre and as opposed to the film, which uh, respectively organise themselves into shots and, and scenes, uh, these would be the main units of, of presentation in, in film and theatre, television or British television drama uses um, uh, units, um, sorry, segments. It uses segments. And segments are self-contained scenes featuring incidents, meanings or modes. And normally they last around five minutes. This is the definition provided by John Ellis, an expert in British television. So these uh, segments are organized in groups in a cumulative fa fashion, as in uh, broadcasts of uh, news broadcasts or uh, documentaries, or they could be organized as a coherent sequence um, arranging episodes in weekly episodes, monthly episodes, depending on what is the televisual product we are talking about. Um, so that would be the, the most important um, important thing to define to define um, British television drama in connection with the with the shop with the film and theatre. 
maybe this is just a way of calling it. Maybe it could be just a, an etiquette or a label and not simply a reality. But this is what people use in, in, in television. Or what some scholars think television uh, uh, is, is organized in. Um, verbal language is privilege in British television drama, which uh, is very often not the case in, in, in film. And not necessarily the case in the theatre. We've got the assumption that theatre needs to be more verbal than, than, than other media, but the reality is that theatre, if we take theatre, the word theatre and performance uh, in the broadest sense of the word, uh, it doesn't go without saying that theatre needs to be worded. In fact, there is a strong tendency nowadays and has been going on for quite a while, and it might be even um, genuine to theatre, to have theatre without words or with very few words. But television drama, or British television drama, sorry, is by definition more verbal than other media. Um, and a proof of that is that very often, if you observe this, uh, this television series uh, showing uh, literary adaptations, uh, it's very frequent to find British actors who uh, generally come from the stage Whereas in, in other, in other contexts, um, we have simply television actors uh, and not <coughs> theatre actors working on, on television. Um, generally speaking, um, British television drama transfers the expansiveness of the theatre stage to a much more reduced domestic and intimate atmosphere, which involves that the connections between characters are much more intimate, people speak more closely to each other, and as a consequence also, the actor also speaks much more directly to the viewer. It is a tendency which is very marked in British television drama and, of course, in uh, British uh, television theatre adaptations. Also, um, presentations of events in uh, British television theatre and drama tend to be continuous, not condensed as it happens in other medium, and there is a high emphasis in character construction. There is a high emphasis on the psychological construction of the character, on incidents which build up characterial personality, and character is very often the focus of the um, television piece. Um, in fact, it has been commented by one of our students uh, that uh, uh, what mm, what really is good for um, on on television's behalf or on television series behalf is that it provides the best opportunities to develop character, which cinema uh, cannot provide, um, even if only because because um, because um, films are shorter than television series. It is an interesting point of discussion, uh, but it is there, which perhaps could be also um, um, an interesting thing to write about for a, a final project. Um, scenes in television tend to be longer, much longer, and uh, television uh, drama uses resources like close-up and the voiceover, which are um, resources which, on the one hand, come from the necessity to address the audience uh, as if we were in a theatre. They are partly derived from conventions of uh, news broadcasts, where the speaker speaks to the camera, the so-called talking head, and also, um, voiceovers are an influence which uh, in many ways comes from the Nouvelle Vague and the cinema verité techniques which were imported by, um, by the UK television directors in the 1960s uh, because of the need to incorporate more European, uh, technically daring and bold uh, cinematic techniques into the television plays. Um, normally, as opposed to um, the theatre, or as opposed to films, which tend to be quite isolated events. Television drama tends to be included within a larger schedule, very often accompanied by documentaries, by previous programs presenting what is going on, and so on and so forth. As an example of this, uh, you probably can imagine uh, Spanish programs uh, like uh, Estudio Uno, which, uh, um, which have always been... Um, presented by Televisión Española, and before the play was shown on the screen, there was always a commentary, uh, lately by Cayetana Guillén Cuervo, by, by some other actors, talking about the play and discussing the play. So, of course, there is very often a, 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 a cultural event around the television play, and with the BBC Shakespeare series, many scholars, actors, directors, and experts in Shakespeare's, uh, in Shakespeare's plays were invited to discuss the plays before 
the the whole place where where were broadcast and um, this is very interesting because these these uh, productions lasted for about three or four hours in many cases and the audiences were ready to stand in front of the television set or sit down in front of the television set for these four hours plus the previous introduction made by the scholars um which means also of course that uh, television uh, has a much more um let's say cultural pedigree uh, depending on the context um while film in many ways comes from photography and uh, and many other arts of course television drama uh, as the the experts say uh, comes from uh, from the radio it's a natural evolution from the radio if you think about this during the first world war um of course, the British um, had the entertainment guaranteed in BBC and in the radio. So um, one of the things that people managed to do at this moment was to uh, be exposed to literary texts, to novels, to, uh, to uh, plays recorded on, 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 the, on the radio so they could be entertained for a, for a while. Sorry, not the First World War, but over the 1920s, 1930s at that point. I, I don't know the dates the date exactly, but uh, the only exposure to culture that the poor classes had uh, before the Second War um, uh, was basically uh, um, the radio and the literary texts and the high cultural texts presented in the radio. And television drama is an extension of that in many ways. Also, television drama is much more metonymic than, um, than, uh, than film. Um, there is a tendency in film, of course, to fill the screen with details. This is the rationale of cinema, thinking about, for instance, uh, great, great uh, screen directors like, like Spielberg or... Uh, or um, um, Ridley Scott, the visual component is enormous. Stanley Kubrick is another example of that. The greatest directors always emphasize the visual work and detail and bore, uh, bold and daring experimenting with the camera. Television drama tends to uh, rather eliminate details and to focus on metonymy, which means things which stand for the whole, little elements which stand for the whole without necessarily presenting the whole atmosphere. So uh, the audience needs to be happy with less information or less visual elements. And we focus more on the text and the performance and the actors. Um, of course, um, television uh, needs to fulfill certain uh, cultural imperatives. When we talk about British television plays and British television theatre, very often they have been associated uh, to, uh, to cultural imperatives. Um, the BBC is a public institution and the taxpayer uh, provides an amount of money uh, for this institution so they protect and promote high culture or what they call high culture, including of course the best of literature, the best of drama and the best of the art. And uh, therefore, the BBC has to provide some Shakespeare productions, some Jane Austen's novels, some, uh, some Dickens to television, some uh, classical music, opera, etc., etc. All these things have to be done by legal imperative. And therefore, there is this patina of um, highbrow culture, which very often surrounds television. And uh, partly because of this, very often people reject uh, Shakespeare or reject um, um, literature or, 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 or um, artistic programs which may, may be too, uh, too uh, let's say, patrician in their attachment to the, to the cultural codes which are promoted by these uh, imperatives. And of course, this has been challenged and discussed uh, over the years. Um, British television drama is not just a, star, uh, a stale and, uh, and, um, and uh, unchangeable and mutable uh, medium of communication. It could use film techniques and many other techniques. And it is not simply entertainment. It could be also a receptacle for public debate, for social discussion, for many things. Very often television is very immediate and it has a great connection to reality. Um, it is less expansive in the sets. Very often British television drama films have been made on studios and recorded in very reduced spaces, which has limited, of course, the, the possibility of going out and opening up the place, which is not what happens with the uh, translations of um, uh, theatre plays to cinema. Of course, as I will show in a few moments, there are examples of the opposite too. But roughly speaking, these would be the, the main features of British television drama. And of course, this would affect Shakespeare one way or another. 
Um, <clears throat> as for the adaptations of uh, Shakespeare to television, there are many classifications. I have just chosen a few ones, which I think are the, 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 the most general and the most um, comprehensive for the purposes of this class. So television plays or plays made for television could be uh, organized according to three categories. We've got stage performances recorded in the theater and broadcast for television, which is something which is quite frequent and, and quite, quite classic. Uh, of course, with many different styles, many different ways of recording, many different modes, and many different um, manners of construction. <clears throat> uh, and then we've got the theatre play recorded in a studio. Uh, an example of this would be, of course, the BBC Shakespeare series, or in the Spanish case, the many recordings made by Studio Uno, by Televisión Española. Um, and also we've got the theatre plays recorded on location, which are very often written explicitly for television, or they may be based on stage plays. But we've got many examples, <coughs> for instance, written by Dennis Potter or by Ken Loach, who uh, wrote specific television plays recorded on location. And of course, many examples of classical plays recorded on location too. The BBC Shakespeare series is special because it recorded the whole canon. So of course, we may uh, agree or disagree with this classification provided by Michel Willems, the French scholar expert in, uh, in, uh, in Shakespeare on television. Um, Michel Williams came up with this, uh, with this uh, uh, classification, which might be debatable, but it cannot be ignored because of the importance and the impact of these, of these recordings. So she um, arranged them all into naturalistic productions, pictorial productions, and stylized productions. Naturalistic productions intended to uh, um, embrace a realistic code in the presentation of, of the place. The pictorial production tried to use um, Renaissance paintings and Renaissance art and sculpture as the main elements in the composition and the frame. So the artistic spirit was, ma was much bolder and much more uh, daring, again, than the previous, the previous uh, recordings. And the stylized productions embrace a deliberately abstract, experimental, and theatrical, sometimes even stagey, pejorative word in English, as you know, uh, way of recording. And we'll be examining a few of those uh, in a few moments. And, of course, there are many other examples of recordings of Shakespeare in British television, um, including, of course, the serial format and simply television films, of which we got several examples made by Michael Bogdano and Christine Ezard, who uh, directed a few films for, for television, and they were basically films with a very low budget and with a very experimental nature. Oops. Sorry. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, it is also very interesting if we periodize British television drama. There are some classifications, one by Les Cook, um, a very important writer if you want to explore British television drama. I'll give you the reference later on. Um, but this is a basic uh, reading if you're interested in uh, knowing how British television is historicized and how it has been developed through the 20th century and, of course, part of the 21st century. So uh, Les Cook organizes uh, British television into early development of ITV TV drama, the race of popular drama and social realism, which happened between 1950 and 1961. Uh, there was a period of maturity and effervescence of British television between 1962 and 1969. And then... Uh, a period of abundance of historical drama, realism, and ideological agenda in television continues in the 1970s with a high degree of experimentation, politically disruptive um, script writing, and um, Brechtian experimental, very often cinematic, <coughs> treatment of the television plays. A dark period comes over the Thatcher era between the 1971 and 1990. At this period, of course, um, the conservative government decides to privilege other ways of um, programming for television and they start emphasizing the need to providing other opportunities of entertainment and not just theater, not just literature, not simply culture, but other forms of culture, more sports, more television contests, more, uh, more entertainment programs. And uh, this means, of course, 
cutting and uh, reducing the budget dedicated to uh, theater in television. Uh, this has been protested and uh, about and uh, commented upon, commented about by, by many directors and producers. Um, during the Thatcher area, the axe was applied to uh, to theater and television. And then this movement continued over the 1990s with the reinvention and the cost-effective policies affecting public television. Uh, public television decided that it couldn't afford to promote theater on television without getting ruined. So uh, <clears throat> more flexible policies were applied to public television and consequently less theater was accessible to the audiences at that period. Many people, of course, have protested about that too. And then uh, let's go continuous with the digital age, talking about the vast plethora of uh, hybrid uh, mixed genre television series which have been populated in the British landscape, mentioning some theatre plays, some uh, plays written for television, but mostly focusing on series, which are the most important, perhaps, uh, product of television nowadays in across the world, but of course also in, in, in the UK which, as you know, presents a, a serial format much, much, much shorter and much more focused on very clear and neat stories and much more focused on character, perhaps, than American television series have been, which tend to work as much more, um, as much larger and, and uh, ambitious uh, narrative um, enterprises. Good. John Wyver and Carl Gartner provide a different account, a much, a much simpler account of British television history. Uh, they present the first period, beginning with the public television and its emergence on the hand of uh, John Reith, the first um, uh, head of the BBC, and then it continues with uh, the emergence of independent television, uh, or ITV, a private channel which uh, intended, of course, to uh, provide different things from those that BBC provided. So less high culture, of course, and more programs which spoke more about, about contemporary things, about social reality, about what was going on in the streets. In the second period, uh, we can refer to the post-war and the, the, the parenthesis in television over the period of war and then the post-war towards the cost-effective area. In this period, lots of great place were arguably recorded for television. Different styles, different ways of recording, different imaginative and creative um, and of course cinematic styles of recording were tried by different experts and professionals including Sidney Newman, Ken Loach, Dennis Potter and many other great writers. <coughs> And the third period uh, begins, of course, in the 1980s with the emergence of Channel 4 and with the consequent uh, coming of the cost-effectiveness area. Very often these visions of television are pretty, pretty pessimistic. Uh, of course, they might be pessimistic if we think about theatre recorded on television. But let me clarify a couple of things. Television is not necessarily more creative in the 1960s than it is today. Maybe there are reasons to argue that television in Great Britain is today more creative than it has ever been, depending on what we're talking about. And, and of course, uh, theatre doesn't need television to survive. Uh, recorded theatre is carrying on, it's continuing through the live performance, through streaming and through many other platforms, not necessarily television. So, of course, um, recorded theatre is finding other ways of expression and other means of expression. Um, so, of course, instead of being pessimistic, perhaps we should think about this as a natural evolution or a natural expansion of uh, British television theatre or British visual, audiovisual theatre, rather than a... Um, a, a um, an apocalypse of uh, Shakespeare on television. Good. Um, let us talk about a few examples, a few um, um, very important examples of Shakespeare uh, on television in Great Britain. And uh, the, the right thing to do would be to begin with uh, Dallas Bauer and his production of Julius Caesar uh, broadcast, live broadcast in 1938. 30, 30, um, unfortunately, this production is not available at this moment because it was broadcast and... Uh, it disappeared. People didn't record it, so we don't have 
the possibility of seeing it at this moment. But it's still a, a very important television achievement. Um, at this moment, in the 1938, uh, which is when early television drama began, we should talk about pre-war televisual conditions. And theatre had a very important place in, in, that, in, that, um, in that schedule. Um, Jason Jacobs has written a wonderful book um, called the Intimate, the Intimate Screen, uh, dealing with uh, the ways in which theatre was recorded at that period. And uh, one of the arguments he presents is that this way of recording theatre on the television screen was a highly technologically potent way of recording, um, trying at all costs to, uh, to develop an aesthetics of recording theatre on television. And very often, these long shots showing actors simply being there in front of the camera, simply talking to each other and not really moving very much, wasn't just a matter of technical limitation. It was basically a decision made by the television directors. Of course, we may quarrel with this decision. We may think, well, why are they just there talking and talking? Well, fine, that could be uh, an opinion. But of course, this is what they wanted to do in many ways. So we had extracts from, uh, from the theater, from theater performances recorded for television explicitly in the studio. We also had full-length adaptations recorded on the studio too, with a great degree of experimentation also. And uh, we also had uh, extracts from live outside broadcasts. That means that very often television cameras would go to the theatres uh, in the West End in London and they would record part of the stage performance, uh, not the complete stage performance, just part of it, maybe one act or two acts. And of course, there was a very good reason for that. The theatre directors didn't want the audiences to have access to the full play um, at home. Then they wouldn't go and see the show. So the purpose of this was to show them part of the production so the people would go to the theatre and see the performances completely. And this attitude, in many ways, is persisting today with many productions. The uh, Royal Shakespeare Company is uh, broadcasting the live performances and they are editing them on DVD. But the national uh, theatre performances, uh, which are broadcast live, are not uh, publishing, they are not uh, releasing their DVDs. If, if, if anyone wants to watch these DVDs, they need to go to the National Theatre Archives in London. Uh, so in many ways, of course, this idea uh, persists, uh, of course, for economic reasons and also for, uh, for other reasons which have more to do with institutional values and so on and so forth. And also because very often, you know, the theatre directors think that uh, the right place to see performances is the theatre and not the television. This attitude is still a very much a very prevalent attitude today, as it was and as it, as it will always be, I suppose, in many respects. Good. <clears throat> um, Shakespeare was invited to be part of this, and um, very, very soon, the incompatibilities between the text and the, the smallness of the screen were visible. Um, you just have to imagine what it is to be in a theatre, uh, seeing Shakespeare or a Shakespeare production, and, uh, and how Falstaff, Hamlet, and Macbeth, and the characters in battle scenes, etc., move freely across the stage. This is not possible in the television screen. Well, it is possible only if the production is well directed, if the production is um, cleverly organized, and if the directors and the directors of photography know how to make the most of the space. And this is something which was very clear, and as we will see, some directors try to do their best in this respect. So, of course, um, contrarily to the, to the myth that if he had been born today, Shakespeare would have become a television scriptwriter, well, maybe, but the truth is that the texts are not, by definition, compatible with the, defini with the, with the theatre, with the, with the television screen. Not at all. Good. Um, this production of Julius Caesar uh, is interesting because Dallas Bauer wanted to fuse the high traditions of theatre in Europe, which, of course, were very concerned with adapting Shakespeare for the contemporary stage with modern dress, with a contemporary views of drama and Shakespeare including, or including Shakespeare, and the strengths of television. So this was the first um, modern dress piece broadcast in television, and it lasted for more than two, more than two hours. 
Um, some experts say that it was inspired by Orson Welles' production of Julius Caesar at the Mercury Theatre. And an example, and a proof of this is that uh, Julius Caesar appeared on stage as if he were General Franco. And um, the fascist iconography of the production proved that there was a, an attempt to uh, contextualize uh, Julius Caesar in a fascist context. Uh, but of course, there is no evidence that, that Dallas Bauer was inspired by, by uh, Orson Welles. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, but it was a very common, uh, common thing to find Julius Caesar contextualized in a fascist environment. Um, the reviews were, were quite positive uh, for this performance. Uh, many people said that um, Julius Caesar had been removed of all the classical trappings which had um, always been associated to this particular play. So it was quite successful in this respect. Uh, all the performances continued um, in the West End. And some of the most important shows were The Tempest and The Twelfth Night. Of The Tempest, we got the evidence of a Miranda speech delivered by, by uh, Peggy Ashcroft in performance, only, the, only this monologue, only the speech by Miranda. And uh, as for Twelfth Night, we got the full production also broadcast for television. This production was directed by Michael Sandinese, who uh, was a French director who uh, lived in, in, in the UK and worked with the actors in the Royal Shakespeare Company later on in the 1960s. And he is uh, in many ways a responsible person for this way of saying the verse that uh, has characterized the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company. He uh, broke up these conventions, these classical conventions of saying the iambic pentameter in a lyrical and solemn way. He tried to find a way of uh, rooting the verse speaking in a much more realistic and much more uh, relevant and psychologically potent way. Um, so so most, most of the uh, basis of uh, Shakespearean acting in the theatre today is indebted to, uh, to Michael Sandinese. Um, what is important about this production of Twelfth Night is that three cameras were used to record the production. Three cameras were in the auditorium, one in the center, and two close together in the orchestra pit. So that means we could have some low angles of the production, which for the time was a great uh, technological achievement. Also, the cameras were highly sophisticated because we just... Uh, uh, very, very slight movements, uh, we could move from mid-shot to uh, close shot uh, and vice versa uh, without changing the angles, which is what people have had to do before, before uh, moving from one mid-shot to a close shot, uh, angles had to be changed, which of course uh, was much more difficult in terms of studio recording and at this time, we could do it directly there in the theatre. And that was a fantastic uh, technological achievement uh, for those who were working at it. Um, and the audiences were not obliged to, uh, to be uh, transported from one angle to another when they were watching the show. As a consequence, they were watching the, the production as you are watching me now, just one single... Uh, one single uh, shot, and uh, and there is not much there is not much angling there. Of course, um, thinking of today's standards, um, many people would find this this approach pretty boring. Um, uh, but there are reasons there are reasons to think that this is what people wanted. Uh, there is a little anecdote I've got about this. Uh, a few years ago, I went to see the ballet, the bro uh, um, live cinema broadcast. Uh, of Romeo and Juliet by the Royal Ballet, and my sister-in-law came with us, and 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 uh, she said that she didn't really like it very much because instead of seeing all the dancers together in a general shot, she was forced to see many close close shots, mid shots, and then again a, 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 a large, a, you know, long shot, extra long shots, and and then close up and extra close up, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, she didn't like it very much uh, uh, because she preferred to see the whole the whole production from a general shot, and I was pretty surprised that she said that because I thought, well, uh, if, if we only see these from a very general shot, in the end, it could be quite 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 tedious. 
Uh, but of course, it is a view which, which might make sense depending on the context. And many of the live performances work on this premise of not, not uh, editing excessively. Uh, of course, many people even then in the 1930s um, protested. Uh, an anonymous reviewer says that it was a very restless performance to watch. Very tiny figures moving in a very small, tiny little televisual frame, very poor lightning and uh, a very awkward and clumsy camera movement, which didn't really help convey the dynamicity of the stage performance. So that clearly showed that in many ways uh, Shakespeare on television was not really uh, at, the, at its best at that moment, not for everyone of course, even if of course there was a clear evolution. Good. Um, over the post-war period, we got to talk about Sidney Newman, the Canadian producer who became part of BBC, and also he uh, created uh, many television programs uh, in the independent television uh, to which he later joined uh, in order to embrace more innovative, more creative, more technologically daring and bolder ways of doing theatre. Uh, when ITV was uh, um, approved by, by the government and when it was uh, given a, a license and when it started working, um, the, 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 the rationale of ITV was to um, precisely do the opposite of what BBC was doing. BBC was concentrated on high culture, education, technical experiment, but always artistic, highly elevated ways of expression. Uh, ITV wanted something much more connected to reality an uh, experiment, but not necessarily focusing on high patrician codes of high culture. In fact, they wanted all the opposite. So uh, that was very interesting in a time in which a great critical spirit um, affected the consciousness, the collective consciousness of the, of, 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 of the English uh, population. We've got to remember that in the 1950s, the Suez Canal crisis um, took place the welfare state uh, found itself in great trouble, not being able to, uh, to achieve the many promises or the many things they have promised to achieve uh, after the Second War. And uh, as a consequence, uh, great dissatisfaction uh, was palpable in the, in the imaginary uh, consciousness and the, the psychological consciousness of the period. But the good thing of that, the, the, the good turnout of this, is that uh, a great creativity uh, could be appreciated in television, in the arts, in literature, and of course in the theatre. Uh, in 1956, uh, a very important thing happened to the British theatre. The Berliner Ensemble visited uh, London um, for a performance. Uh, the Berliner Ensemble, Ensemble was the production, was the, 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 the theatre company which had been run by Bertolt Brecht. And as you know, Bertolt Brecht might be considered as the father or one of the fathers or the forefathers of uh, the 20th century theater together with Pirandello and, and Lorca and many other great writers. Um, so that completely changed um, the, 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 the views of theater in the, in, the, in the West End. Many people started copying and imitating the Brechtian style, the use of cameras on the stage, detachment, and so on and so forth, which were uh, the, the, the greatest uh, contributions by Bertolt Brecht in the, in the theatre. If you think about it, if you uh, consider the musical shows in the West End, in many ways they derive from, uh, from, uh, from musical comedies, from the, from the from the operetta and musical comedies, but of course they are also in, indebted to, Bre to Brecht in, in many respects. Good. Uh, also, more European uh, ideas came through Cinema Verité and the Nouvelle Vague, which were incorporated to, uh, to television. Cultural studies as a discipline were developed also in the 1960s, and uh, the Royal Court Theatre was also alive and kicking. Um, if you have studied English, uh, English literature from the, 19, sorry, the 20th century, I'm sure some of you may remember uh, John Osborne's Look Back in Anger, a production which in the 1956 um, meant a revolution in the theatre. And it was the beginning of the uh, wave of thinkers called the angry young men, at least in the theatre. Um, social reality, being outside, being in the outside world and not being confined to the 
uh, staticness of the studio theatre and the pompous way of delivery of British actors from the stage, this this wasn't acceptable anymore, um, or or it wasn't acceptable by but for, for for some directors and and uh, people like Sidney Newman were aware of this reality and sometimes they openly despise uh, theatre plays like Hamlet, although he was interested in Shakespeare, but. But very often he uh, boasted about not knowing Hamlet or not having read Hamlet. He was very famous for, for his um, pride in not having read Hamlet. And of course, many people were scandalized. How could you not know Hamlet? Of course. So, so obviously, um, this is what the panorama was at that moment. Nevertheless, Shakespeare had a place in this, in this, in this uh, uh, political cultural debate in, in, in television. Uh, BBC uh, incorporated uh, Shakespeare to the serial format, uh, which is interesting because today there is a lot of talk about Shakespeare being uh, a scriptwriter for television series too, apart from a television writer, just also a scriptwriter for television series. And uh, in the 1960, An Age of Kings was produced and directed by Peter Dews. Um, this television series comprises the the second and the first Henriot, and and they are presented in the in the chronological order. So uh, the 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 series begins with a uh, with Richard the second. It continues with Henry the fourth, part one and part two, Henry the fifth, and then it continues with Henry the sixth, part one, part two and part three, and it concludes with Richard the third. So rather than following the chrono the, the order of uh, production in the Elizabethan period. Uh, they follow the chronological order. Uh, and, of course, that reconfigures completely the, the, the play and the reception. Um, they follow the fashion of Victorian installments. The plays were broken down into smaller episodes, and uh, um, people could see the show weekly at home. And uh, what was interesting is that by the standards of the time, it was a very interesting and technologically daring spectacle, too. Uh, actors try to find a way to accommodate the way of talking to the small camera. That is a very interesting thing. Rather than just delivering as if they were in the theatre, they try to accommodate the speech to the intimacy of the frame. A very interesting scene is the one in which Richard II is killed on the, in jail uh, with the actor David Williams whispering his last lines against the boss as he's backstabbed by a by the by the murderers and uh, um, many other experimental and daring scenes were tried in this respect and uh, there was a great emphasis in this uh, series of plays as a political thriller very often of course brechtian elements were incorporated there were castles shown on the on the sets which were very much in many ways toy castles and uh, sometimes when the episode finished um, the actors were shown changing their dresses, going back to the to the to the dressing rooms, and uh, the cameras were shown around the place, uh, reminding the audiences that this was, after all, a television play. So many interesting things happened with this series, which was, by the way, re-edited a few years ago, and now it is available on DVD and very likely also in the internet. Um, because the series was so successful in the United States and also in the UK. Uh, Peter Dews thought he might try recording also uh, The Spread of the Eagle, which was another try. This time, uh, the, 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 the idea was to record Coriolanus, Julius Caesar, and then Antony and Cleopatra. Why Titus Andronicus was neglected is something I do not know, or Cymbeline. Why were they neglected is something I do not know. I suppose it's because Cymbeline was a rather obscure play and because there were strong prejudices maybe to to a record Titus Andronicus. Um, but in any case, the series was not very successful. Um, um, people say, uh, Susan Willis uh, says that uh, very likely it wasn't very successful because um, there wasn't really a, a great continuity between the plays. The only character who appears in, 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 in more than two episodes is Mark Antony, well, and also Octavian. Uh, but apart from those two characters, there is not much we can say about the continuity of the series. And definitely Coriolanus has no connection with Julius Caesar, nor Antony and Cleopatra. So, of course, although this was a series, it wasn't really a series in the strictest sense of the word, but rather a, a pack of serialized 
uh, television plays, uh, very much like the BBC Shakespeare series was. Um, even then, there were a few acting, acting, uh, uh, acting surprises, or some actors who were extremely popular after this show show was done. We could find find Paul Eddington playing Brutus. Paul Eddington would become Jim Hacker in the series Yes Minister and and subsequently Yes Prime Minister. And Keith Mitchell uh, played Mark Antony, and he would play Mark Antony again for the BBC Shakespeare series, and then he would become Henry VIII for the Six Wives of Henry VIII in BBC Two. Uh, what is also a very interesting and uh, bold development in this production was that the cameras went out to the streets too, as Ken Loach and some other television film directors have done. Part of the scenes, or most of the scenes, were recorded outside. Um, so, of course, these uh, achievements were becoming more and more cinematic or certainly more centrifugal and more expansive than other uh, examples of studio drama have been in relation to Shakespeare. Um, the Royal Shakespeare Company also tried in 1970 uh, th their own uh, serialized form of entertainment with Shakespeare and they came up with a, a fantastic production called The Worst of the Roses, directed and adapted and very often rewritten by John Barton and Peter Hall, uh, two of the most important directors of the Royal Shakespeare Company at that moment. The Worst of the Roses uh, was much more modest than An Age of Kings. Uh, they focus only on the, on the first Henry ad, so they only did uh, Henry VI, Part One, Two, and Three, and Richard II. Sorry, Richard III. This is what they did. Um, Sidney Newman was involved in this production. He wanted to really produce that, 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 that show. And it was directly recorded on the theatre, where the production had been taking place. Uh, the stage performance... Um, presented a set with a big metallic metallic grill uh, as if everyone was uh, everyone were caged in a in a ki kind of a zoo facility as if the uh, characters were animals just about to destroy each other in this claustrophobic environment uh, these grills which were distributed across the state and across all the areas um, provided a stark and violent and, and, and terrifying atmosphere for the, for the production. Because it was difficult to record the, the, the series uh, in a theatre. Uh, they, they had to remove half the seats of the theatre, and also they had to extend the stage platform, and the uh, cameras were included in the orchestra again, in order to again provide the possibility of recording with low angles apart from from just the normal frontal angles in in the theater recordings and as a consequence uh, comparatively speaking considering we were in a theater uh, a wide range of camera movements and camera uh, possibilities were displayed and utilized in this production which i thoroughly recommend to you and uh, which you can also find in, on dvd and and very likely in youtube as far as i remember good now, it is important to dedicate some time to the BBC Shakespeare series, which is, as you know, a very important landmark. For some people, a very unfortunate landmark, but nevertheless, one which we have to take into account, yes or yes. Uh, and of course, um, uh, the main reason why, why this is important is because it took six years to, to produce. Six years of continuous uh, television showing of Shakespeare in the in the BBC uh, every Sunday morning so, sorry every Sunday afternoon all the families knew that they have the possibility of watching a or viewing sorry a Shakespeare play at their homes uh, um, many people of course decided not to not to view them <laughs> but it was possible for them so uh, Cedric Messina and uh, Jonathan Miller were uh, very important, iconic figures in this, in this production. They wanted to create uh, a recording for the whole canon. Uh, they wanted to produce an orthodox box set of, of videotapes, a sort of folio text in, in video, with an eye in the, in the educational market, of course. And the rationale of their productions um, was that the directors couldn't uh, 
um, experiment too much. They couldn't work against the Elizabethan spirit of the place. Um, so uh, no Royal Shakespeare Company artists, no directors were invited to direct the shows because the Royal Shakespeare Company had in its very rationale to question, interrogate and challenge receive readings on the on the texts. Uh, therefore, that meant that the uh, PBS and American producers said that, sorry, but the Royal Shakespeare Company shouldn't be part of this, uh, unless they follow the rules. Of course, some directors were invited. Peter Brook was invited to direct some of the of the plays, but he simply wasn't interested in doing it. Um, so uh, um, what we have here is a, a, a series of productions which intended to be straightforward renditions of the plays. And some of them were quite interesting. Uh, and they had a reasonable level of audience rates. For instance, Romeo and Juliet, directed by uh, Alvin Rakoff, reached, uh, um, the, the reached uh, 1.9 million viewers uh, when it was uh, broadcast, which in comparative terms wasn't really a bad figure. Um, just to give you an idea of that, the Foresight Saga normally had 17 million viewers. So uh, it was a low, a low, a low figure, but but at least it was a figure uh, in comparative terms. Uh, Jonathan Miller, Shatton, and uh, and and many other many other uh, producers and people involved in the in the creation of this of these episodes noticed the problem of the BBC Shakespeare series. They noticed that they were not making very appealing shows but if they wanted to do them they had to follow the house rules which were utterly inflexible in this respect um, so some directors and some producers decided to work with the constraints which the bbc and the pbs were imposing on them as a consequence very remarkable productions were produced and uh, an additional detail that uh, maybe you want to uh, uh, pay attention to is that some of the most interesting actors of the period were were employed for the for the productions. Uh, Helen Mirren and Robert Lindsay, who are stars in the British theatre stage and the and the British film film uh, panorama, were uh, involved in the in the um, in the symboling. Uh, Roger Daltrey, the singer in uh, The Who, and and at this moment a solo singer, uh, took part in the the comedy of errors. Um, Derek Jacobi which became quite famous for his, for his work in I, Claudius, became one of the most important Hamlets ever. Just to give you an idea of this, uh, Kenneth Branagh, who uh, directed Hamlet in the 1990s, was really inspired by Derek Jacobi's performance of Hamlet, both in the BBC um, um, broadcast and also on the stage. And in fact, he wanted Derek Jacobi to be Claudius in this Hamlet. Um, Alan Howard was a, a very remarkable Coriolanus, which is worth watching, and uh, there were many other interesting productions with um, splendid actors of that period and splendid performers. Um, so, of course, um, for many reasons, this, this series is worth watching in many ways. So my recommendation is take your time <laughs> to see a few of the episodes if you want to, and, uh, of course, the best thing I can say to you is patience with it. But... Uh, but I think you should watch a few of them. The naturalistic productions uh, had a very clear purpose. They were uh, recorded in realistic, in realistic uh, settings. So uh, the Roman plays, like Julius Caesar, would be recorded in a, in a Roman setting, very much following the the, the style of I Claudius. Um, Henry VIII was recorded in the in some 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 historical sites in the UK, including Leeds Castle. Uh, also, they follow the conventions of Holbein's paintings, trying to create a Tudor atmosphere or recreate a Tudor atmosphere. And Romeo and Juliet, in many respects, uh, follow the aesthetics of uh, Franco Sefidelli's Romeo and Juliet. What was the problem of trying to, uh, um, to uh, produce realistic pieces for television was, first of all, that... Uh, if if a director or a producer want to really be realistic or go realistic on television when producing a Shakespeare play, realism means money. We need a big budget to really achieve a level of realism. Uh, if we are not going to achieve this, this level of realism, as the story goes, 
Some people would say, well, why don't you just try to explore the possibilities of a cheap budget in television? Why not try a more symbolic, a more abstract, a more challenging approach to a recording theater rather than trying to imitate reality? Um, and of course, uh, Alvin Rakoff and some of the directors were a bit obsessed with the need of making the films realistic and because of that reason although Romeo and Juliet was in many ways a remarkable production um, and very often quite daring and quite bold production especially the first scene with the Montagues and the, and the Capulets fighting in the piazza in Verona um, in many ways the production was uh, a bit deceptive because or, or defective because it didn't really achieve the standards of realism it pursued um, so that was an important lesson to learn from that period. And Jonathan Miller um, clearly saw that realism wouldn't be the road to, to go uh, if, if they wanted to uh, do really remarkable uh, productions. So Jonathan Miller thought about um, applying his, uh, I would rather say, uh, strange and bizarre ideas and, and, and uh, opinions on, on, on classical theatre performing in television. Uh, he was convinced that if, if, if one wanted to really make the classics relevant, he had to be disrespectful to them. If you wanted to, for example, set Hamlet on the stage, you have to think about how this play would make sense in a contemporary setting. Very often, if necessary, working against the grain of tradition, very often even contradicting the text, because the moment one text is transferred to another place, the text means something completely different. So he came up with very personal and very bizarre ways of recording. Uh, an example of this is Antony and Cleopatra, which was contextualized in the Renaissance period rather than in Rome and Egypt, which of course in many ways is what uh, uh, the Renaissance stage would have done. Many productions of uh, Antony and Cleopatra actually uh, use Elizabethan costumes because arguably this is what Shakespeare would have done in the in the production. Um, Anthony and Cleopatra are presented as figures who vaguely resemble um, uh, the Earl of Essex and Elizabeth the first or that's more or less what this, the textures of characterization suggests to me. But the most important thing about these productions is that he tried to uh, uh, to, to, to support himself with, a, with a Renaissance paintings, uh, Renaissance paintings by uh, Vermeer, Caravaggio, and of course Holbein and many other artists of the period. Um, so turning the, the, the productions into pictures, into paintings, of course, is something which worked in line with the interests of the BBC. The BBC said, we've got to contextualize the place in Shakespeare's times, and using Renaissance painting was a way of doing that. So uh, if you think about it, of course, Jonathan Miller's movement was very clever because he thought, well, let's try to find a visual language which doesn't contradict the Renaissance spirit. Well, paintings will do, will do it in this respect, and that was a very clever move in this regard. Uh, he applied these techniques also in Troilus and Cressida, a very remarkable production, and also in The Timing of the Shrew, uh, which is a very interesting, uh, a very interesting show, uh, because he chose uh, um, 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 John Cleese as Petruchio. The, the excuse uh, he gave to uh, choose uh, this, this actor to play uh, such a, such a, 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 let's say, Latino or a Mediterranean or, or a, a passionate character as Petruccio was that um, thinking of Faulty Towers and many, many shows where John Cleese have been involved, uh, this Puritanism, which uh, this mock Puritanism, which was detectable in Mr. Faulty, would be useful for Petruccio. So what he does is he turns Petruccio into a sort of Puritan uh, who genuinely wants to educate uh, Catherine. Um, mm. And of course, this bold reading arguably was based on the philosophy of Puritanism in the Renaissance uh, period. Some experts, of course, have said that this is not necessarily anything connected to Puritanism, but basically Jonathan Miller's, Jonathan Miller's imagination. <laughs> but of course, it's something which he proposed, and uh, it's a very interesting production, which of course uh, can be very controversial in this respect. Uh, 
Elijah Moshinsky was uh, cinematically much more, much more daring. He used a deliberate filmic style. Uh, he combined um, chiaroscuros with the bold uses of light. He recorded the place mostly indoors. He cut the text, he rearranged the scenes, and very often he divided the scenes into smaller chunks, um, which would approach the, the productions in more cinematic ways. And all the characters were very often um, endowed with a great sensuality. He was very obsessed with the idea of sensuality. And there is a wonderful scene, which I think is present here in the pictures. Yeah, it's there. I don't know if you can see it, but... Um, uh, if you can see the face of Helen Mirren and Robert Lindsay, this is the scene in which Yakimo is trying to approach uh, Helen Mirren, well, um, Imogen, while she sleeps. And, uh, and she is just about to try to make love to her at that moment. It's a wonderful, sweaty scene, which of course uh, represents very much the, the style pursued by, by, by Elijah Moshinsky. Um, a, a bold, a very bold and extremely... Um, intelligent director was Jane Howell, uh, doubtless my favorite in this regard. What Jane Howell did was to simply apply um, common sense. She said, um, Shakespeare's plays are theater plays, so what we are doing on television is uh, theater. Uh, let's not apologize about doing theater, so we're going to do it theatrically. So uh, she uh, um, f relied upon Brecht and Brechtian styles of recording and, and staging, she deliberately chose to uh, make a stagey proposal and combine intellectualism with a playfulness and an ensemble of actors playing the whole um, first Henriad, Henry the, the Sixth, Part One, Two, and Three, and Richard the, Richard the Third. The actors uh, played many parts. Many of the actors had to play as many parts as as. As, as it was necessary in order to complete the, the films. Uh, I don't remember the name of the actor, but the, the, the person who played uh, uh, Jack, Jack Cade was the one who also uh, played John Talbot. So uh, this was very much the rationale of the production, an ensemble of actors knowing the play very well and involved in this wonderful feat of prowess of knowing exact of knowing four plays and taking part in them, and of course working as if they were in the theater. Uh, so for this production, uh, Jane Howell created an adventure playground with swings and with uh, well structures where actors could find ways to uh, to experiment and to uh, playfully approach the characters. But also she combined uh, this idea with a tremendously interesting camera work. She used slow motion, she narrowed the, the, camera, the camera frame, she expanded it, she played with many conventions of cinema, although she was uh, recording this in a, in a studio, in a theatrical studio, adapted specifically for this production. So it is really worth watching and, and really interesting also in this in this regard. Uh, the RSC recording uh, recordings which appear in the 1972, 1978 and 1971 uh, preceded these BBC recordings and um, and they presented a, a very different a very different way of, of, of doing things on, on the television film or on the television uh, recording of Shakespeare. What, what differentiates uh, BBC's uh, productions from uh, RSC's productions is that the RSC's uh, recordings were based on previously staged productions. So uh, the advantage was obvious. The actors have had the possibility of playing the, 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 the parts on the stage for about 100 times. So when Ian McKellen and Judy Dench did their famous Macbeth in uh, 1979, uh, they had been already doing the, the performance at the other place in Stratford upon Avon. So of course, uh, the, 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 the possibility of translating to the, to the, to the television uh, screen what had been done uh, in, the, in the stage um, gave the directors the possibility of exploring uh, with more time and with more relax, what could the, the camera do in these productions? In 1972, uh, a production of Antony and Cleopatra, directed by Trevor Nunn and then translated by John Scofield by the, to the to the theatre stage, sorry, to the theatre stage, to the 
to the television screen um, gave the actors the possibility of using close-ups and sometimes uh, the, the the image and the the the, um, the, um, the recording was out of focus de deliberately in order to uh, provide the Egyptian scenes with a with an aura of uh, of uh, mysticism as if what was happening in Egypt uh, was a kind of mirage a kind of uh, fantasy uh, which we could appreciate with maybe with Anthony's eyes or with Ino Barbas's eyes as opposed to the cold hieratic and uh, very well structured and uh, harmonious and order means of presentation of the Roman Senate in the in the first scenes where where um, the first speech is is delivered and uh, we can see how the Roman senators listen to the story of how Mark Antony has been degraded by his own behavior in Egypt. Uh, the Macbeth, um, directed by Trevor Nunn and, 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 uh, and uh, recorded by Philip Casson, is also a very special production because uh, from a very minimalist um, uh, staging in the other place, in Stratford, which uh, some of you may know involve all the actors being constantly there uh, around a circle a chalk circle which of course invoked the the supernatural element in the production the camera reduced the space even more and more and more and thus the focus uh was only on the text on close-up and no visual element was uh, um was uh, given to the to the viewer for distraction. So this is really filming the text, as more than one critic has pointed out. And for many people, this is a Macbeth for the mind, another Macbeth for the stage, nor even for television. Um, the Comedy of Errors wa was also recorded at that period, in 1978. And what is interesting about this production, featuring the wonderful actress uh, Judy Dench and Francesca Anis uh, in the main part, uh, is that it was recorded on the stage. It was adapted as a musical show with songs incorporated and laughing tracks, inserts showing the audience and the occasional movement between the backstage and the stage were also conveyed through the camera, which uh, would be important precedents for other productions, which I'm going to talk about in a few moments. Perhaps uh, a very interesting um, set of productions you could uh, focus on at some point would be the, the the films made by Illuminations Media between the 1990s and the 2000, 2012. Um, Illuminations Media is a production company directed by, well, run by John Wyver and by several other several other producers and experts, um, which which um, is not dedicated to Shakespeare but to the arts. But nevertheless, they produce some some interesting films. Uh, which have been called hybrid productions by by the producer the, himself and also by by some scholars um, these productions uh, uh, took stage stage performances and then they translated them to the television screen so uh we could mention of course deborah warner's richard ii in 1997 uh, this famous production in which uh, richard was played by fiona show in a um, gender-based statement uh, which of course focused very much on the relationship between Bolingbroke and, uh, and, and Richard and Rupert Gould's Macbeth was also incorporated to this, uh, this um, so-called canon or group of films and most of Gregory Doran's um, big productions such as Hamlet and Julius Caesar and Macbeth with uh, Harry Walter and Anthony Sher were incorporated to this to this canon too. Uh, what these productions have in common is that they uh, tried uh, a, uh, a visual language, they tried to find a visual language which intended to keep the essence of the original stage productions or this is what what John Wyver and Greg Doran used in order to or, 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 or mention in order to refer to the the place they chose to record the, the, the films on location um, and not in a studio nor a theater and the purpose of recording the place on location was that um, they would probably find some atmosphere a history some kind of 
uh, magical element which would uh, energize the text and at the same time would liberate the camera to do whatever the director of photography thought necessary to convey the grandeur of the original stage productions. Uh, something which is interesting about the spaces chosen was that they were locations with a theatrical uh, air in them. So they chose the, the, the London Run House where many years before uh, Tony Richardson's Hamlet had been recorded, they also played, uh, recorded part of the some uh, Julius Caesar in the Oriental Centre in the area of Edgware Road in London. And what happened is that very often a theatrical space was um, utilised for some of the most important public scenes. The private scenes would be recorded in the surroundings of this theatrical space. So, in many ways, what we can say about we, we could say about these films is they are meta theatrical or at least meta dramatic, which in, in this respect uh, follows suit with many of the productions made by um, Orson Welles, Laurence Olivier, Franco Stefidelli, Peter Brook, and Grigory Kosinstev, and uh, and uh, right before the 1920s and uh, and uh, the 2000s. Uh, Christine Ezard's productions, um, which were of course quite striking and bold in this regard. So, uh, so um, these attempts, of course, um, provided examples of how experimental could Shakespeare be on television. Many other attempts were made to serialize Shakespeare on TV, apart from the Wars of the Roses and 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 many other shows. In the two thousands, um, there were ideas about perhaps repeating the BBC Shakespeare series. This is something that some, some Mendes wanted to do. But of course, in the end, the budget didn't allow, allow the producers to uh, come up with, a, with an adequate way of recording all the productions, especially because he wanted Judy Dench and Ian McKellen and Jude Law to be in all the plays. <laughs> so of course, that meant more money, more problems, and more difficulty in terms of doing it. And he, of course, wanted a more cinematic approach than the one pursued by the BBC Shakespeare series. Many writers uh, tried, like, like Andrew Davies, for example, tried to serialize Othello on television and even The Tempest. Uh, but many of these attempts failed completely. The Shakespeare Retold series, as you probably know, was um, produced in the 2005. Uh, and what was interesting about this production is that the, the use of contemporary language and contemporary idiom, rather than the Elizabethan Shakespearean texts, um, served to, uh, to uh, get the audiences near Shakespeare in this, in this specific place of Macbeth. They, they did Macbeth, uh, Much Ado About Nothing, uh, and some of the places like the, like the uh, um, um, Midsummer Night's Dream and, and some of the productions, which were quite interesting in this regard. And of course, I recommend them to you uh, as soon as possible. What is the, um, the last point I want to tackle is the, the idea of Shakespeare as a uh, serial uh, televisual product, which you can find, of course, um, culminating in the Hollow Crown uh, Part One and the Hollow Crown uh, Second Series. The first series was produced in 2012, and it was uh, directed by Rupert Gould, by Richard Eyre, and Tia Sharrow. Uh, and this production would comprise Richard II, Henry IV Part One, and Henry IV Part Two, and also Henry V with uh, very important cinematic actors like Tom Hiddleston, Ben Wyshaw, and of course Jeremy Irons playing Henry IV in Henry IV Part One and Part II. Uh, but what's interesting about this, this, uh, this, this first series is that different directors were required to record the different plays. So uh, Rupert Gould did Richard II using a very personal and uh, filmic uh, approach to record uh, Richard II's fantasies and, and visions, and in many ways resembling uh, medieval fantasy films, and uh, in some of the respects war films, and, uh, and uh, a slight touch of Oscar Wilde-ish characterization for Richard II. And then, of course, the Henry IV plays were directed by Richard Eyre, Using a much more realistic and uh, and uh, medieval in the in the social in the natural in the literal sense of the word 
applied on the screen. So there was not much of a style in this production, rather the, the, the historical facts were presented as if they were historical films. Um, and Henry V would be uh, the culmination of this with Tom Hiddleston uh, seen in progression in the three films, Henry IV, Henry IV Part II, and then Henry V. Um, with Brexit and with uh, the celebration of Shakespeare's birthday, the second series, The Hollow Crown, The Wars of the Roses, or the second series, um, appeared on the television screen. And uh, what is interesting politically about this production is that uh, precisely it appeared uh, at the time of Brexit, uh, consciously or unconsciously, the, the first episode begins with uh, Judy Dench's voice um, reciting Ulysses' speech in Troilus and Cressida, the speech in which Ulysses talks about the importance of rank and degree and order in the universe. And at the same time, the camera is showing in an aerial shot the white cliffs of Dover. And as you probably know, if you are familiar with British cinema, with British war cinema, the White Cliffs of Dover are uh, important iconographically for Great Britain. They are the symbols of the nation, of the decline and of the strength of the nation. So it was significant that um, debate on uh, hierarchy, order, um, political order and harmony is used to introduce the second, uh, the second series of, of episodes. Uh, what is also important about this production is that uh, only one director was hired to direct them all, uh, Dominic Cook, uh, who was in charge of the three films. Uh, the four original plays were compressed into three episodes, and uh, what Dominic Cook did was to cut lots of the secondary plots. For example, the Jack Cade Rebellion was eliminated, and the focus was tightly uh, put upon or set upon uh, the, the the Lancaster and the, and the York family and, the, and, the, and their quarrels with lots of experimental cinematic movements and lots of experimental shots which were uh, very interesting in terms of uh, in terms of recording and a most interesting thing also here in this production was that um, actors like um, like uh, Sophie Oconedo, Judy Dench and of course Benedict Cumberbatch were incorporated in the film. Sophie Oconedo uh, played um, Margaret of Anjou, the she-wolf of France, which uh, emphasized the otherness of, the, of, the, of this French uh, lady coming to the, English, uh, to the English throne. And Benedict Cumberbatch, of course, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Sherlock, decided to work on Richard III uh, with a real physical deformity. He really emphasized this real deformity, um, which would, of course, depart from other views of Richard as a rather allegorical figure. It would make it a psychologically charged and uh, physically limited figure who uh, genuinely felt resentment uh, on this deformity. A very striking um, beginning in this film is the the now is the winter of our discontent speech, which is delivered by Benedict Cumberbatch, completely naked uh, from the waist up, uh, in his private room, trying to uh, control the pain produced by the hunch, and uh, and uh, and uh, and delivering the speech uh, in the most malicious way possible. It's not a it's not a very funny uh, beginning for the film, and very often this speech is quite spectacular, but this one was a rather striking one. So if you, can, if you want to see that one too, that would be very interesting also. And of course, for Sherlock fans, I got to tell you that there is a surprise. Some other actor of Sherlock is, is in, the, in this production, uh, in the Hollow Crown series. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but there is another actor from Sherlock, a very popular actor from Sherlock. So I'll let you find it out if you watch the, the episode. And... Um, and this is it, guys. This is what uh, the class has been. Uh, I would like just to finish with a few commentaries on the on the importance of, of Shakespeare on television. Uh, Shakespeare on television is something which is constantly being changed. It is a varied genre for television. Straightforward productions which focus on, the, on Shakespeare's texts have been tried with uh, many styles and many different approaches by different directors. 
ranging from more traditional uh, stagey studio ways and theatrical ways of performing and then more cinematic and more realistic and more experimental and, uh, and, and stylized uh, ways of, of recording too. And my recommendation is um, try to watch as many of these productions as possible. Sometimes it is difficult to, um, to, 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 to see some of them. The BBC Shakespeare series is a demanding show for viewers, especially for contemporary viewers who are used to HBO or to uh, all the types of television shows. But if we learn to appreciate it, if we learn to appreciate the artistry of the production and the richness of the visual language very often used in those productions and the filmic decisions made in, in, in each of the individual pieces, we will discover that at least uh, uh, the styles were extremely rich and extremely experimental and innovative in many ways although of course there are lights and shadows as as you know the working bibliography i have used for this class is uh, most of all basically michelle williams verbal visual verbal pictorial textual televisual reflections on the bbc shakespeare series which provides the basis for the study of uh, of, of the series as i have told you she gave the classification which has been a standard classification in this respect Susan Willis is an expert in the, in the BBC Shakespeare plays. If you want a more thorough study on the production circumstances on this place, you can uh, read this book, which is extremely uh, informative in this regard. If you're interested in British television, uh, in, a, in British television in theory, a theoretical and cultural approach for British television, John Corgi's book is uh, your book. If you're interested in cultural studies, um, John Coy offers a, uh, a very thorough um, vision of British television drama um, from, the, from different points of view, post-structuralist, reception theory, and some of the uh, theoretical perspectives we are handling in the uh, degree of Philologia Inglesa, or Studios Ingleses, and also the master's degree of uh, uh, cultural studies and literature. And those of you who are interested in the history of British television, style in British television drama by Let's Cook is definitely your your book okay in this regard so uh my recommendation is to take a look at those and and that is all thank you very much for for your attention if you're interested in carrying on uh discussing if you are, have any questions or if you want me to recommend uh, want me to recommend you any uh, any specific productions or, or shows or if you want to discuss all the things having to do with the uh, Shakespeare on television you're more than welcome thank you very much and hopefully we'll meet personally at some point